some things that uh, I would encourage everyone to do, if you're going to use open telemetry, you have to connect open telemetry to some kind of backend uh, in order to see your data. Uh, at Lightstep, we've developed a free community account uh, specifically for people wanting to, to work with open telemetry and give that a try. Uh, so I highly recommend uh, if you want to follow along uh, with this uh, tutorial, uh, we have a code walkthrough um, that uh, I'm going to be adding a lot of comments to, and I try to keep these up to date with the latest version of open telemetry. Uh, so there's this repo, Hotel Java Basics. And um, this, uh, this has everything you need to kind of get started with open, uh, open telemetry Java from a sort of copy paste perspective. Want to make it easy for people to have a single resource that they can copy paste these patterns out of. And uh, I try to keep these up to date. So I think that's a relevant resource uh, for people to take away. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about the, the Lightstep launchers here. Uh, this is just an easy way to configure open telemetry. Um, and uh, I also have a, a quick start guide uh, that gets into more detail about this stuff. Uh, it's still pointing at Go. Java. Um, so uh, this is a little out of date because the latest version of open telemetry Java just came out three days ago. Uh, I've updated uh, Java basics, however, to, to match the latest version. So that's what we're going to cover. But if you want to do all this stuff and follow along, the easiest way to do it is to create um, an account with Lightstep. So it's really easy. Just put in your email and uh, hit sign up, and you get an account right then and there. So uh, I would encourage people uh, right now, uh, if you can uh, I think the best way to do this is to, to sign in. And then uh, when we're done with the workshop, try uh, just just try running this code after we've gone over it in the workshop uh, and, and have a look through it yourself. I think that's a great way to, to just recreate what I'm going to do for you here. Okay, so we're going to get started. But again, uh, I want this to be interactive. Uh, I prefer uh, answering people's questions over just uh, monologuing. So if you have any questions along the way, uh, please bring them up. You can either put them in the chat or there's also a Q&A tool that you can use. I'll be trying to monitor both on the, the side over here. Uh, and I'll be stopping periodically to answer questions. We, this is a very short workshop. We only have 50 minutes. Um, the future workshops, I'm going to make them 90 minutes. Uh, so we do have to move fast through some of these concepts. But you will also get a video of this afterwards uh, so you can rewatch it. And with all that said, uh, let's kick it off. So getting started with open telemetry. Uh, the first thing I always want to point out with open telemetry is what is the scope of this project? Like, what is this project? trying to solve. Uh, and it's trying to solve the telemetry portion of observability. So telemetry is the part where you're creating observations and then sending them off to some uh, remote station that is going to analyze those signals. So we see open telemetry as a project for uh, creating and transmitting uh, telemetry about distributed systems running in the cloud. And that's the scope of the project. You'll see how that kind of makes sense uh, a bit later. There are other components, of course, to any observability system. Uh, there's the UIs you use to interact with it. There's the databases you use for long-term uh, stable storage, uh, things like that. Um, those aren't part of open telemetry. Uh, open telemetry is actually a standardization effort. What we want to do is standardize how, uh, how people um, produce their data, and we want systems to be able to start producing data natively rather than needing external instrumentation added as uh, plugins and things of that nature. So that's, that's the goal of the project, to, to make it that so that every system in the world uh, produces the same kind of data and you can link all of that data together in a structured fashion uh, and be able to have a lot of use out of that without knowing too much about the details of the services that are producing that information. So that said, let's dig into like the actual big architectural pieces you'd be interacting with as an end user. 
the way open telemetry works uh, is inside of your service, which is this green circle here, uh, you install something called the open telemetry SDK. Uh, the SDK is the open telemetry uh, client. Uh, this is the implementation of open telemetry, or I might say a um, a implementation of open telemetry. You'll see in a bit that it's possible to make alternatives. Uh, but it works as a framework, so you have all the usual framework pieces uh, uh, that you can would imagine lifecycle hooks, plugins for exporting data, uh, things of that nature. But uh, when you set up the SDK, and in Java this is automated, you do that when you initialize your application, but you never touch it outside of that. So you never touch the SDK directly in your application code or in a shared library or anywhere where you want to instrument your code. Uh, instead, you use the open telemetry API. So this is just loose coupling. Uh, what happens here is if you use the API, which is packages that just contain interfaces, they don't contain any implementation and thus don't have uh, any dependencies that they haul in. Uh, it's very lightweight to haul this API directly into your code. So you, uh, the parts of your application that are most important uh, to have instrumented are the parts that control the, the runtime of your program, so any kind of scheduling going on within your program, and then your clients and servers, anything doing network connections. All of those things need to have instrumentation in them, uh, or open telemetry uh, won't be able to work. So we provide instrumentation for uh, popular frameworks, um, and we'll just continue to grow that and maintain that as stable. Uh, but all of those frameworks, what they do is they, they rely on this public API. Um, and so when they haul that API in, they don't have to worry about hauling in a bunch of dependencies or ending up with some kind of transitive dependency conflict uh, because they're only uh, referencing this stable API. So uh, when you're instrumenting your application code, you use that. So that's the most important thing to know, use the API. Uh, and then uh, you, of course, want to be able to export this data um, off of your system and to some backend where you're going to analyze it. And that is called uh, a collector. Uh, I should point out that you can export data directly to backends. You don't need to use a collector, uh, but we do recommend uh, running collectors uh, as a way to alleviate of the workload that's going on in your server and alleviate some amount of configuration that you're doing within your server. We recommend you run the SDK in as default a mode as possible, um, pointed at a collector either running as a sidecar or running uh, in the same local network and um, do all of your configuration in that collector. So that collector can then be configured to talk to a variety of different backends over different protocols so open telemetry has its own protocol called OTLP. This is, uh, uh, I referenced this earlier, this is a data protocol that includes all of the signals together. So tracing metrics, uh, eventually logs and other things uh, are all baked into open telemetry OTLP. But of course, uh, you may wanna send this data off to other systems like Zipkin or Prometheus uh, that only support you know, one portion of, of uh, the, the one of the signals that we're producing uh, and maybe don't speak o OTLP natively. So inside the collector, you can configure these exporters. Uh, there are also processors that you can run in the collector. So this is where you do your data massaging, um, scrubbing your data for you know, anything sensitive, uh, being able to uh, take um, old conventions you were maybe using and, and translate them into new conventions. All, all of the kind of uh, data munging that you would want to do along the way, you can do in the collector. Uh, so that's the point of that collector piece. And that's the one uh, outside of these SDKs, this is uh, the one piece of infrastructure that Open Telemetry currently provides. Uh, you'll note that we don't provide any kind of analysis system or stable storage. And again, that's because we think that stuff is all kind of greenfield and is all going to continue to change rapidly. And that's not the part where you go about trying to standardize things. What we wanna standardize is the data that all of these systems are analyzing. So there's a universal language for being able to describe these distributed systems that we're running. 
And the way we manage all of this across all these different language implementations in order to make sure everything feels like open telemetry everywhere is we have a specification. So we have a language neutral specification. We make RFCs against that specification. Uh, when they get approved, we version the spec and then all the language working groups uh, implement the latest version. So that's like the fundamental structure of open telemetry as a project. Uh, we work on the spec together and then we go off in our different language groups and we go and implement that spec. So that's it for kind of the, the overview of the components uh, that you might encounter in open telemetry, the SDK, the API and the collector. Uh, if you have any questions about those, this would be a good time to post them. Um, I'm gonna keep moving on just to keep us in time though, uh, but uh, post your questions and I'll come back in and answer them. Uh, the next thing you need to understand when you're using open telemetry uh, are some core concepts about how open telemetry views the world. Uh, and we view the world through the perspective of distributed transactions. So you need to understand what I mean when I say distributed transaction. And then we'll have a, another core concept called um, context propagation uh, that makes open telemetry work. So uh, this next section will be about like, the fundamental value that open telemetry provides and uh, some of the pieces you need uh, in order to for that to work. And if you can wrap your head around these core concepts, then uh, a lot of the open telemetry architecture will make sense. And Manohar asks, what does the API do? So the API uh, is an instrumentation API. So think log4j. Log4j is a good example of, of uh, implementation being uh, uh, separate from the interface. Uh, so open telemetry provides something like log4j as an API for doing tracing metrics uh, and all of the other observing you want to do. Uh, so that's what you use the API for. Uh, in Java, of course, you have a Java agent and we also have a lot of automated uh, instrumentation that we can do. But in your application code, it's usually easiest to, to use the API directly. And we'll be going over uh, how to use that um, when we get to the walkthrough portion of this. Okay, so let's talk about transactions. So when I talk about a distributed transaction, I'm talking about everything we do every day as developers and SREs. So if you take, say, the, the simplest transaction I can think of is something like, uh, I have a mobile client and I wanna upload a photo and a caption for that photo. Simple enough, right? Uh, so what are the components that are involved uh, in that fairly straightforward transaction? Well, you have a client, of course, uh, and that client's going to make a network request to some kind of server, but we know it's not going to be just one server, right? There's a number of things that have to happen here. And the most basic thing I can think of is uh, that client would connect to a reverse proxy. That reverse proxy would connect to an authentication service when the auth is approved the reverse proxy would start uploading the photo to say local scratch disk. Uh, once that's complete, the proxy would call an application server with the location of the photo and the, uh, the caption. Uh, the application server would then uh, chop it up, do whatever it needs to do and upload uh, the photo to S3 or some other kind of cloud storage. And then uh, write down the location of the photo URL and the caption in a database. And let's just say that database in this case is the data service that sits in front of a combo of MySQL and Redis. Uh, uh, if you've been programming for a while, this, I feel like this, this pattern comes up over and over again. Uh, to me, uh, this is like when you're in production, to a certain degree, this is about as basic as you can get. And I just want to point out that even uh, something this basic uses like what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different services are involved. So even when you have a monolithic application, uh, the transaction is still distributed. There, there's a, a large number of services involved in any transaction. And if you want to actually view this transaction and put it back together and understand uh, what led to what, you need to have all of that data ordered and organized in such a way uh, that you can turn it into a graph uh, and understand not just the individual logs and the individual metrics, but, but how they're related to each other in a causal fashion. 
So in order to do that, uh, we I'll get to the details of how we do that, but uh, how we tend to think about these transactions and how we tend to display them. Uh, this service diagram is a nice way to, to think about a transaction, but it doesn't tell you the, the order of events. Uh, the way you can get that are what we call these sort of trace graphs. So in any tracing tool, you'll see uh, some kind of interface ultimately that looks like this when you're uh, interacting with your data. Um, you know, we've got, let me see if I've got one right here. So here's an example in Lightstep of uh, trace this workshop produces. Um, but if you look uh, at the basic idea, uh, the way these work is you have a bar that represents an operation within a transaction. Uh, we call these operations spans and they measure when the operation began and when it ended. And uh, it notes the network connections or any other uh, linkages between this operation and other operations. So we have an operation, then we have a network call, another operation uh, in the proxy, which makes a network call to the auth server. And then it makes uh, a local operation called writing to disk. Uh, then it makes a call to an application server, the application server calls the data services, and so on and so forth. Uh, so these kinds of graphs are a great way to understand a lot about your system. Uh, first of all, you can understand what called what, uh, what services were even involved in a transaction. That's useful information to know and have at your fingertips. Uh, the other thing we really want to know is latency. Uh, where did all the work go? Uh, it's not the case that the longest operation uh, is the thing that generated the most latency in your system uh, because mostly operations are waiting on other operations to complete. So for example, this client operation is the longest span because it starts at the beginning and then it waits for everything to get uploaded before it ends. But if you wanted to optimize this system, you have to go find where the work is actually being done. And with uh, distributed tracing and these kinds of graphs, it's uh, fairly straightforward to create a heuristic that points out um, where the actual work is being done and also where um, systems are just waiting on other work being done. And so in this case, uh, we call this the critical path, the thing you actually need uh, to have at your fingertips if you want to make your system run faster. And you can see from this case, the two slowest bits are not surprisingly uploading the file locally and then uploading it to S3. And you can see that if you wanted to go in and optimize this database or this data server, you could do it, but that's really not gonna move the needle for you because ultimately that's only contributing a small amount of latency to the overall system. So even if you made this uh, as fast as possible, you know, one microsecond, then you would still haven't, wouldn't really change the actual overall latency. You actually have to uh, find a way to upload these photos faster if you want to do that. So that's a primary thing that, that people uh, use tracing for. Uh, that's uh, a lot easier to do uh, with this kind of trace graph than it is to do with traditional um, logs that are kind of all disconnected from each other. The other thing you wanna look at, of course, is errors. Uh, which service or operation did the error come in? Was it, you know, uh, the client is registering a 500, but if you see a client 500, you wanna be able to just click a button see this trace and see that that 500 was ultimately generated by the authentication server or it was generated by S3 uh, or one of these data services. Uh, being able to start with a, a downstream effect of an error like noticing that a client uh, has 500 and uh, quickly work back from that to the root cause of the error um, rather than having to dig around a lot to figure out what uh, server operations were connected to this client operation. That kind of stuff just hop happens automatically uh, when you're using a tracing system. And you'll find that that actually saves you a lot of time and effort uh, when you're uh, trying to debug your system. Because uh, you, will I think, f discover that a lot of the time and effort you're putting into debugging your system is actually just finding and collecting this data 
so that you can analyze it and do something about it. And tracing kind of eliminates the amount of finding and collecting you have to do. Uh, and of course, uh, it's not enough to just have uh, these large scale operations. We also want to have individual events within those operations and AKA logs. So we don't call trace, we call these trace events instead of logs, but they're effectively logs. So uh, trace events are just individual events on the timeline, uh, but it's very structured data. So each event has you know, a message name, but then it also has structured data associated with it. So it's structured logging. But then that uh, event itself is situated within an operation. So you know what operation occurred. And then that operation is part of a trace. So from any event, you can find all the other related events. Uh, and that's ultimately the thing that uh, uh, you're trying to do when you're, you're debugging a transaction. You also want to be able to correlate these transactions uh, and figure out uh, patterns uh, in the aggregate of data that you're checking out. So you want to be able to know, um, say that, let's say you're seeing 500s. Um, you want to know what correlates with that 500. Uh, let's say it's for um, updating a project. You have a concept called a project, and projects have project IDs, and you're seeing um, uh, errors and problems uh, around um, uh, something to do with these projects. If you had a project ID as uh, an attribute that you could correlate, uh, a, a tracing system might automatically notice for you that all of these particular errors uh, correlate highly with the project ID matching a, a small number of uh, values. So in other words, uh, you might notice that uh, actually uh, these project errors are only occurring for a small number of project IDs. They're not uniform across all of your projects. And that would probably give you a, a good insight as to uh, what the problem might be or where to look. So having these correlations are, are hugely important. So OpenTelemetry provides a lot of this stuff out of the box. Uh, we have standard conventions for describing things like HTTP requests and host name and uh, things of that nature. Um, but you're also going to want to then add uh, your own application specific attributes to uh, all of these spans in order to correlate these transactions uh, uh, by your application concepts, not just by low level concepts like network connections and things like that. And ultimately what this gives you is, is this, this thing where you have all the logs across all of the things, like you have not just one app server, but 50 app servers and 50 database servers. And uh, you need to find uh, uh, the path of execution from just one of these 50 to another one of these 50. Uh, and you might have a request ID that will let you find these, but what about two hops or three hops? Uh, how do you connect all of those logs together? Uh, that's where you spend a lot of effort kind of um, searching and filtering to find these logs. Uh, because, and the bigger your system gets and the higher scale your system gets, uh, the smaller percentage of that data is the data you actually want to look at for a particular transaction. Uh, so that's the thing that we want, just automatically being able to find all the other logs associated uh, with one log in a transaction and have a lot of rich data about that. And the way we accomplish that is something called context propagation. So if you understand uh, how context propagation works, uh, everything else in open telemetry is going to make sense. So let's dive into that. So imagine you have two services uh, and they have some operations. So my little mouse likes to bump my slides. So you've got operation ABC and then a network call uh, to DEF in the uh, second service. So just a very basic thing. But if you want to be able to connect all of these operations into a graph, you need two things. You're going to need an ID for each operation. And then you're going to need an ID for the overall transaction. So we call those span IDs and trace IDs. 
And when one system talks to another system, this downstream system needs to know what is its parent span ID so it can connect into the graph. And what is the overall trace ID uh, that you would use to find all of these events. And in order for downstream systems to know that information, uh, it has to be propagated in band. And so the way that works is there's something called a context object uh, that uh, is like an environment. Uh, you can think of this as like thread locals, uh, but it's a, a context object that, that follows the execution path of your code uh, and is basically a bag that you can put things in and take them out like trace IDs and span IDs. Uh, so we call that the context object. And then when you make a network call, you need to propagate that context, uh, serialize it and deserialize it in some way so that uh, the service downstream uh, can gain access to that. And so we call serializing context injection. So you can think of this as setting um, in HTTP, we inject context as HTTP headers. So uh, when you make a network request, some extra headers automatically get added uh, to your requests that contain this tracing information. And then on the other end, uh, you have a system that extracts that information. Uh, and so that's propagation and inject and extract. Uh, you won't interact with this directly very much, but it's important to understand that this is the flow of execution going through your program. And if you can inject and extract, uh, this context successfully, then you can turn it into another context object, continue on your merry way. And then if this talks to any further downstream services, uh, you can inject and extract uh, that context and continue the flow. Uh, so that's how we connect all of this data up to each other. But it does mean you have to have this context object which follows the flow of execution and you have to have these propagators installed. Uh, so if one of these things stops working, then you'll see broken traces. And that's why it's important to understand this concept because, for example, if you've misconfigured one service is injecting using one set of headers, and the other service is extracting from a different set of headers because it was misconfigured, then the tracing will be broken between these services. So you'll occasionally encounter that kind of bug when you're setting up your system. So you need to understand this to be able to debug that. Uh, and that's like the one big idea behind tracing. Uh, to get a little more concrete um, about these headers, uh, we're actually trying to standardize these headers in HTTP, these HTTP headers through the W3C. So there's a tracing working group in the W3C. Uh, and we have one set of headers called trace context. Uh, so you will see a one header called trace parent. And uh, it has a couple of fields in it. It'll have the trace ID, which we talked about, that's the overall transaction ID. And then it'll have a span ID, which is the operational ID. And then there's some other details you don't have to worry about. Uh, we're also working on another thing called baggage. And this is just arbitrary key value pairs. So if you want to be able to um, say, just pass a variable down through your system, and we use these to pass things like project ID. For example, if you, access to project ID in service A, and you wanted to index something in service B with that same project ID, but service B doesn't have access to it or it would be expensive to make another database call to find the project ID. You could instead uh, propagate that project ID as baggage, and then it would just follow this flow and you can pull it off on a downstream service. Uh, so that's, that's context propagation becoming broader than just tracing. You can use this for, for other purposes. Uh, so A-B testing, um, uh, authentication tokens, things of that nature, uh, you can make use of baggage to, to pull those off. So that's just a little aside. Okay, those are the big ideas. Uh, that was a lot in a short period of time, uh, but we've only got 25 minutes left. So I'm gonna now switch over to looking at code in Java. Um, if people have questions about context propagation, uh, please post them and I'll, uh, I'll get back to them once I see them pop up. In the meantime, uh, we're just gonna move on to a little code walkthrough here. Uh, so if you wanna do this and see it run for real, uh, 
you can download this Hotel Java Basics uh, repo and um, uh, just follow the basic setup instructions here. Uh, you'll need to get an access token from Lightstep uh, that's in your project settings. Um, and then uh, we just have some standard build scripts that, that make this work. Uh, so if you want to, uh, just to be clear, the thing that you actually install with these build scripts is a Java agent. Um, and uh, we have a pre-configured version of that Java agent called the Hotel uh, Open Telemetry Launcher. So these are open, to, this is an open telemetry distro. Uh, and all distro means, if you see this word, is it took open telemetry and just bundled up some of the configuration uh, for you so that you don't have to do that yourself. Uh, so that's what distros are. So this is just an easy way to, to get started. And all you do is download the jar, add it as a Java agent. Um, there's a set of, um, uh, system properties that you will need to set in order to make it work. Uh, and then you're off to the races. So let's have a look at the actual code uh, and what this actually does. So if I pop up my code here, um, we've got two ser we've got two programs uh, in this uh, simple application. We have a client and a server. Uh, the server is just a little servlet um that serves up uh hello world at the route slash hello uh nothing super complicated there um and then we have a client and what this client does is it makes uh five requests to hello world in a loop uh so that's all that's going on there uh so what we can look at though is how we actually use the open telemetry API to add instrumentation to this. Uh, so the first thing uh, that's important to notice is that uh, open telemetry, the open telemetry agent will automatically install instrumentation uh, for things you're using. So the OKHTTP OK client will automatically get instrumented by open telemetry. You don't have to install that instrumentation yourself. The, the agent does it for you. Um, likewise, uh, on the server side, we have servlet instrumentation. Uh, and what that means is that when you use the uh, HTTP client here, uh, it's going to automatically record data about what that HTTP client did. And it's also going to automatically propagate uh, those, uh, that context for you. Uh, likewise, on the server, the servlet's going to automatically uh, create instrumentation. It's going to create a span uh, for every uh, handler that gets called uh, in a request. And um, it's also going to extract and set up that context for you. So you don't have to do any of that so long as you're using uh, clients and servers uh, that have supported instrumentation. To get into how you actually add your own application data uh, to one of these systems, uh, you start with uh, grabbing the current span. Uh, so what this means is uh, you grab an object that represents that span concept I was talking about earlier. And uh, because we have context propagation going on, it's just available for you in the background. So you don't have to pass it around as uh, an argument. You just call for current and that will give you the current span. And this span, in this case, we didn't have to create it. Um, it was created by the servlet instrumentation. And this is the general pattern you want to follow. There should already be an active span available for you in any of your application code. So you don't need to make a child span. You just grab the current one and then decorate it with more information. So uh, one thing you can do is add attributes to the span. So these are these correlations and indexes I was talking about earlier. Uh, so in this case, I'm adding uh, the HTTP.route convention uh, and setting it to hello. This is the thing the servlet didn't do automatically for me uh, because it doesn't know about the concept of routes. Uh, but maybe I want to have a route that's like hello name. Uh, so uh, the attribute HTTP.route uh, uh, is where you would set this. And this gets into uh, what I was talking about 
um, before, which is uh, some standardization in how uh, this data is produced. So we have what are called semantic conventions. And so for anything common like HTTP or a network connection or anything like that, we have standard keys and values for you to use to define that. And what that does is it allows backends to automatically know what this data means, right? Because it knows that HTTP dot stuff is going to be in some expected format and that'll let you know that something's, you know, a client span or a server span. Uh, so uh, everything will get standardized. And if you look at the data that comes in, uh, I can just show this to you. Um, so here is a, uh, uh, the get request that is created by um, OKHTTP. Um, and you can see that we've added the flavor, the method, the status code. Um, you'll notice uh, the instrumentation that produced uh, this span is also present here. And the version of that instrumentation, that's really useful information when you're trying to figure out what generated this telemetry data you're looking at. Um, and you can also see some network uh, standard network attributes. And all of these attributes let you quickly find other things. So if I want to find anything else that was using this URL, I just click on that. Um, and then that'll do a query for that URL. It's not going to find anything because I just, I haven't run it recently. Um, but that's like the basic pattern. And if you look at this client is then talking to a server. Uh, so this is uh, the servlet instrumentation that was created. And likewise, we have all of these server side standard attributes added onto that. Uh, but if you wanted to add your own, like for example, we added HTTP route here, you do it by grabbing the current span and setting an attribute on it. So that's the basic pattern. If you're interacting with this API, uh, you're going to be interacting with this pattern the most, just adding more attributes to the existing spans. Uh, the other thing you can add are events. Uh, so these are logs, right? So, um, and this just uh, works the way you would expect. Uh, you have your log message um, and then uh, keys, a set of key value pairs that you can add onto that log message. And then those messages will, will show, up, um, show up as events. So we don't have the world's best log viewer here, unfortunately, but you can see uh, we've logged an exception, for example, uh, and then uh, this is our writing response event that we put in here that shows up down there. So that's the other thing you're gonna do a lot of with open telemetry is you're gonna add events the same way you would add logs. And one thing you can do to get a boost potentially is you can take your existing logging system uh, and maybe shim it in in such a way that when you make a log, it grabs the current span and turns that log into a span event. Uh, that's an easy way to get the data you already have uh, that's kind of unstructured, less structured log data, and then put it into your tracing system and then automatically have it uh, gain all of this structure. Uh, so that's a useful getting started approach. So that's attributes and events. There is one special kind of event, which is called exceptions. Uh, so uh, the exceptions are just events uh, that you record, but because we want them to be specially formatted, we have a helper function called record exception. Uh, so uh, if you have an exception, that's uh, how you add it uh, as an event on your span. But I want to note that just adding an exception as event doesn't make the span an error. Uh, in order for a span to count as an error, you have to change the status of the span. So spans by default are unset. Uh, they assume to be working correctly, but uh, if an operation fails, then you set it to error. Uh, and the reason why this doesn't isn't a one-to-one -one relationship with exceptions is because you know you can catch exceptions and move on. So it's not the case that every time there's an exception that automatically means an operation failed. Uh, so you want to be able to record exceptions and then uh, set errors as two separate steps. Uh, but you do need to set the status code to error if you want these spans to show up. So 
you look in this case, this span, all the red spans are ones where we've recorded uh, uh, recorded this exception and, and logged an error. So um, that's the basics of interacting with the span itself, um, setting the attribute, adding events, recording exceptions, setting the status. That's literally it. That is all you need to do to interact with open telemetry in your system. But there are some more things you may want to do. Uh, I just want to emphasize, though, that when you land in open telemetry, it might look like this big, crazy thing with a lot of stuff. But as an application developer uh, or an end user, you don't have to interact with most of that stuff. It's just, it's just this super basic pattern that you can copy paste. And that's all you really need to do. Uh, if you do want to make child spans, uh, so in this case, we have the span uh, created by um, uh, the servlet handler. And then we're adding a child span to that. So this is a new operation where we want to record um, its latency uh, and have all of its events and attributes correlated. Uh, you do that by grabbing a tracer and calling start span. Uh, so uh, this tracer object that you need in order to build spans, this is something that you have to create a handle for. So if you want to create child spans, what you need to do is first create a tracer um, in the context that you're trying to observe. Um, the convention is to, to name the tracer uh, after your package name. And this is what allows uh, this instrumentation name and instrumentation version to work. So we can see here uh, that this came from this package as opposed to say, um, automated instrumentation that was provided by open telemetry. So if you want to make child spans, you first make a tracer and name it so we know who's making these things. And then with that tracer, uh, you just build a span. The only thing you need to do is name it. Uh, you can add attributes to it and other things at this time. And once you've made it, you need to start it. So as soon as you start it, that kicks off the timer. Um, but beyond just starting a span, uh, you also want to make it current. Uh, so this is a one little piece to remember. You don't want to just start and end a span uh, and pass it around by hand, generally. Uh, you want to create a span and then set it as current. Uh, and that's what allows you to grab, grab it off of current. Uh, so to do that, you need to create a closure. Uh, we call these scopes. Uh, and so all you do is you take the span once you've created it, you call make current, um, and then uh, you have access to this span uh, within this closure from this point onwards. So in here, span.current returns this my service span. Well, you know, if we go up here, uh, sorry, my mouse isn't working very well today. So if we go up here, um, uh, we can see this is the span that was created by uh, the auto instrumentation. And down here, this will return this span we've created ourselves. So that's how you create child spans. And by default, the child spans automatically become, these spans automatically become the child of a parent span uh, if there's one available. Uh, so they'll automatically become the child of the current span. Uh, if, unless you overwrite it. Uh, so you can use this if you want to break down larger operations into smaller operations. Uh, we also have a, a shortcut. We have some annotations that make this uh, easier to do. So there's a with span annotation. Uh, so if you just do this and name it, then all of that setup work, all of this setup work happens for you automatically. So this is actually, in my opinion, the most convenient way to create, uh, create child spans. Um, so you just say with span, and then you know, from within here, you can now just be like span.current you know, set attribute, et cetera. And so really all you need to be doing in your code is if you want to 
pull out an operation to a sub operation, annotate it, um, and then go in and decorate it with, with all the attributes and events that you want. And that is actually it. That is everything you need to know about the Open Telemetry API to, to get started and start using it. You just install the Java agent. That Java agent comes with a bunch of auto instrumentation. Um, you can look up uh, uh, what auto instrumentation we provide. Um, I think the easiest way to grab that, let me see if it's on the Java launcher. Here, launcher, do we list all of this? You may not. Um, you can find this in Open Telemetry itself, though. So, Open Telemetry, Java instrumentation. Is this link hidden for people? Um, and if you scroll down here, we have a list of everything that's supported. So this is everything we currently support. So quite a bit. Uh, we're not starting from scratch here. Uh, we're starting from pre-existing instrumentation that we've ported over from prior systems. Uh, so that's why we're able to support so much stuff out of the box. And that's the basics. Uh, I'm going to move into Q&A at this point. Um, do people have any questions on this? Is there any pattern that people would like to see demonstrated? This is the thing about not having voice communication is people have to type out their questions and it's a little hard to tell if people are typing or not. But uh, I'm willing to hang out here uh, for the next 10 minutes and uh, discuss that. Otherwise, uh, <clears throat> maybe while people are writing those questions down, I'll just uh, skip into some other topics that are relevant that people might want to know about. One is um, spans. Uh, how many spans should you make? It's, it seems easy to wrap a method in a span. So shouldn't every method have its own span? And the answer is no, you don't want to do that. You want to have very few spans. Uh, you know, somewhere between like one span per library uh, in your operation is probably right, one or two. And the reason for that is it's a little more expensive um there's this span management you have to do um and a lot of systems today aren't capable of actually uh doing great analysis across uh, attributes that are spread across different spans that problem will probably go away in the future um but for the time being it's better to have coarsely grained spans that have lots of attributes and events on them uh and the only reason you want to create a subspan is because you want to measure the latency of that particular operation, uh, or you want to understand the, the errors coming out of that particular area. Uh, so you can add them, uh, and you should, but you should be um, you should be thoughtful about the spans that you add. You don't want to just automatically add spans to everything, because uh, they'll actually make your data worse, not better. Another thing uh, that can be a little tricky is actually rolling open telemetry out uh, within an organization. Uh, so because as we showed, you have to do this context propagation. This only works if everything is connected up to each other, which means when you want to deploy distributed tracing, you kind of want to deploy it everywhere to all services. Uh, not just deploy it to this service over here and then some other service over there. Uh, because otherwise you will have these broken traces, you won't really have any value. The value comes out of having all of the services in a transaction 
connected up with open telemetry. And that means adopting it um, uh, might be a little bit di more difficult as like an engineer or an SRT, SRE or a team leader, because you're going to have to go to other teams and convince them to, to also adopt open telemetry. Uh, so uh, if you have a centralized place where you can get all of that set up, that's what I recommend. Ideally, the operators uh, can just add the agent uh, to, a, to everyone's deploy and just uh, redeploy it. Um, but if you can't do that, if it seems like it's going to be difficult to get it added everywhere, uh, the next best thing, in my opinion, is to pick some high value target, a transaction that's just important in general, like checkout or uh, something that is slow and you really would like to understand why this operation is slow, but you haven't been able to track it down. Um, picking a goal like that and then going in and instrumenting just the services needed uh, to, to get data about that goal, uh, that can make it a bit easier to, to drive a, adoption within your organization. Because you can go to other teams and say, hey, I'm trying to understand X. Could you install this thing? to help me understand X. OK, we do have a question here. Uh, Pendra, nice to meet you. How does this instrumentation then impact performance of the app itself? I'm sure there are guidelines around this included. Yeah, uh, so it's one of those it varies kind of questions. Uh, we will have performance tests uh, when we, you know, as we go stable in 1.0, this stuff, there will be performance tests so you can see publicly uh, how it works. But what we're committed to is all the instrumentation we provide uh, is acceptable to run in production. So we will be able to give you an estimate of how the instrumentation we provide affects your system. We're trying to keep it under 5% of resource utilization. But uh, obviously, if you add your own, uh, it's a little hard to say. Um, because it depends on how much work you're doing. Uh, how big are your payloads, for example? So it's a little hard to say like how many spans you can create or how many events you can create uh, for that reason. And so hopefully that answered your question. Uh, Gunjin writes, can you recommend some simple OSS products that consume these spans to give some useful insights out of the box, mainly to get an end-to-end -end demonstrable demo rolled out? Uh, Fast, right. So um, this is like you want to actually view this stuff. Uh, well, as I mentioned, you can just grab a free Lightstep account. And I know I work at Lightstep, so obviously I'm shilling this thing. But seriously, like we pushed hard to create this because we really want this to be the easiest thing you do. Uh, you just sign up here and then toss your access token in uh, and run the agent. And uh, you see data. Uh, the next best thing is to use an open source tool. I recommend uh, Jaeger uh, to look at tracing. So Jaeger tracing to get all the Jaegermeister out of my search query. Um, so uh, you can also, so I would say Lightstep or Jaeger. What you can do with Jaeger is it's fairly easy to spin Jaeger up in a Docker container locally. Uh, so if you want to just be running locally on your laptop, uh, Jaeger is a really good solution. Cool. Well, we're just about at time. Uh, I know that was fast and uh, we covered a, a broad range of things. But again, we'll be sending these video, this out as video afterwards. Uh, so you can rewatch it um, or just uh, go check out this code. Um, you'll notice it's like fairly well commented um, or hopefully. It... Uh, and I'll be adding more comments to this later, but um, but you should be able to just grab this example repo and just kind of uh, go into the app server here and and copy paste things out of it. And that's that's a straightforward way to get started with open telemetry. Great. So uh, that's all I got. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any final questions, uh, ask them now. And otherwise, uh, thank you very much for coming to my workshop. Great.
Thanks, Pupendra. I appreciate it. Uh, Muhammad uh, asks, how do we integrate it with Hibernate? Uh, that is a good question. Yes, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Gunjan. I really appreciate, uh, really appreciate it. Uh, so let's see if Hibernate is currently supported. Uh, I believe it is. Uh, where did I put that? I'll just grab it out of the uh, here. Ah, that's not my fine feature. Right, so Hibernate's already supported. Uh, it's because JDB is supported under the hood. Um, so if you go have a look here, uh, each one of these repos, oh, this is actually just pointing to Hibernate. Um, but that's, that's, it should, uh, should just be provided out of the box, basically, um, with at least uh, uh, basic information. And uh, yeah, SQL queries and all of that. Um, if you look, uh, this needs to get updated, but my walkthrough, just to go back and pitch this stuff at the end. So here are these handy links again, if you didn't get them before. And here's again, a link to these slides. The slides might shift around a little bit, but you're always welcome to come have a look at them. Um, in this quick start guide, I do need to update it, but, um, uh, one thing you can look at with this is uh, running a pet clinic. Um, don't think we're linking to it again yet, but a pet clinic. Uh, is uh, A nice example app that includes SQL database stuff. Uh, so this is like a simple spring app. Uh, but if you're looking to see like a more complete regular trace that includes database queries and things like that, uh, you can have a look at instrumenting Spring Pet Clinic. Uh, that's an easy way to check that out. Cool beans. All right. I think that's all we have time for. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can also hit me up on Twitter, by the way. I'm at Ted Suo. Um, so come say hi there. Uh, you can feel free to DM me with any further questions that you have. And I appreciate it. See you all around.